Good morning. Good morning. So this is about to be really interesting. I whew, let's let's just do, let's just do this. Let's just do this. So yesterday, Saturday, Saturday there was a comment on my latest protest post by Pastor Samuel Dade attacking me as childish, accusing me of snapping on him, of making implications about his heart and his ministry toward women and when I shared that particular flyer, there was a backstory that caused me to hesitate. But I knew, despite how triggering that particular flyer was to me personally, there was a necessity that the truth be spoken, that the truth be spoken without bias, even at personal cost to myself. So while Pastor Dade's response was disappointing, because I know the backstory, it was not surprising. I want to thank those of you who reached out to me um, publicly and privately in support despite not knowing the backstory which I am going to share now um, I knew that at some point I would step forward and share the story I did not imagine it like this <laughs> I did not imagine it being today right now <sighs> but I woke up this morning and the Holy Spirit said, speak. And I wrestled with it because this is not how I plan this. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit said, speak. And so I'm going to be obedient. The story that I am going to tell you is the truth, the entire truth. Whether or not you choose to believe me is up to you, but it is the truth. And I hope I will see you on the other side. I will be using names, real names in this story. And I had questioned as I thought about how I was going to tell this story, I, I wrestled with myself about whether I should say all the names. And when I saw that pose, it was the confirmation I needed that yes, all the names needed to be spoken. So, <sighs> June 11, 2009, both of my parents were killed in a car accident. I had just turned 23 the month before, and as the eldest of my siblings, the responsibility of estate management and arrangements and, and, and all of that fell to me. And as many of you know who have had to deal with situations like that, nobody is prepared for something like that. Usually if you are going to bury a parent, <laughs> you're, you know, in your 50s, 60s, you've had a whole life with them and you have a whole life of experience to draw from. And even then, who who is taught how to plan a funeral? Who is taught how to deal with funeral homes and estate lawyers? No, nobody, <laughs> nobody is really prepared to deal with something like that. Least of all, when you are 23, least of all, when it's both, <laughs> I was completely out of my depth. And so Pastor Sherwin Callwood, who has been a wonderful 
um, friend to our family reached out to me and said, let me put you in touch with a pastor who can help you with all of this, who has experience in this area. And I was so grateful. I leaped at the opportunity. The introduction was made and the pastor that I was introduced to was so helpful. I cannot tell you what a relief it was to have someone older, more experienced to, to help guide me through this process of just dealing with everything that is involved with a tragedy like that, an unexpected tragedy like that. I was grateful. And because I was so grateful, I ignored or rationalized away the the small things I would notice it would it would happen right here at the corner of my eye and by the time I turned to look he would be there with an, an explanation um, and I was like well oh, okay um, little things that just it, it didn't seem quite right but I was 23 I was very unexperienced um, I was still a virgin and I had been very sheltered. So I knew nothing about the ways of men. I knew nothing about my body, my sexuality. I didn't even know what size bra I wore. That's how ignorant and naive I was, poor little thing. So when this pastor started doing little things, little things, holding my hand. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I do this with my daughter all the time. Oh, oh, well, oh, you're treating me like a daughter. Oh, I appreciate that. Oh, okay, well, I guess that's okay then. I remember the first time he kissed me, it was in a parking lot after having a business meeting over lunch broad daylight and I I froze because you you just kissed me but you're a pastor and you're married but I'm standing in public in in broad daylight so what what has just happened what maybe it's me Maybe I I am very sheltered. I am very inexperienced. Maybe it's me. Because he can't be the one wrong. Surely. Sure, surely not. It, it, it must be me. It must be me. Um, and so I would explain away. And I, I would rationalize. And until one day, the line was firmly crossed. And... I was petrified because now I knew, and it, it wasn't sex at the time, it was, it was a makeout session, call it that, but I knew this is wrong. Oh my gosh, this is wrong. He's, he's old and he's married and what is happening? Oh. And he began to speak to me softly, quietly. He would tell me years later that if you come and you stand very close to a woman and you speak right into her ear and you use the, the bass of your voice, you know, but in a very low and calm tone. You can literally vibrate a bone in her ear that will begin to calm her, calm anyone you're talking to. Um, that there is a way to bend someone's mind, his words. But at the time I didn't know any of this. All I knew that very, very much like uh, 
a snake being charmed by the artist with the flute. I, I, I listened and slowly he managed to convince me almost that he wasn't wrong. Um, he was so lonely. He didn't know how much, you know, he had needed someone like me in his life. How I had just seduced him with my wisdom, with my maturity. What a blessing from God I was to him. How he knew that this relationship wasn't going to be something that lasted forever. How could it? I, I was so young and of course I had all my life ahead of me. But he was just so grateful that, that God had brought him to me, brought me to him at this point in his life. And it just, it meant so much to him to have me in his life. And, and I didn't fight it. I tried. I did try. And many women who have been victims of abuse know about the trying. You will try. You will try to leave. And yet this person has something that you need. So you will have to go back. Whether that person has your identity, whether that person has your children, whether that person has your self-respect, whether that person has the money, for whatever reason, the average woman will attempt to leave three to four times before she's successful. And it was true for me. I did try, but I was still 23. And I still had an estate and lawyers and, and all this trauma to deal with. And I had no one else to help and nowhere else to go so I would go back <laughs> and he would be so good and so loving and so kind and so gentle and he would help me um, even at the times where you know I hadn't done everything that he told me to do and I, I would try to lie and cover that he would still support me he would still be there for me and so I kept going back. I remember, I remember when he took my virginity and that moment of panic, seeing my blood on his penis because that wasn't something that Danielle Simmons did. Danielle Simmons was a virgin. Danielle Simmons was going to be a virgin until she got married. That's the plan. That's how my parents raised me. I, I, this was not supposed to happen. I did not even know it was about to happen. Not here, not now. And again, in my panic, he spoke low and soft. It's okay. It's all right. This is part of life. <laughs> It would be two or three years before I would be able to break the sexual tie of the relationship. Two to three years that I lived as a secret of a married man. There was one occasion where um, he got me a hotel room to come and see him. A Saturday, he came from his church to the hotel room, had sex with me, and put his suit on and went back to church. And I thought, there's something wrong about this picture. There's something really, really wrong about this picture. But it would still take me two to three years before I could break free. And even then, it was not of the entire relationship. 
Because see, by then, I had bought into the lie that he was my friend, that he did need me. And what sort of friend would I be to, to walk away from him, to abandon him, you know, just because I was better? You know, you were there for me when, when I was going through all, all these hard times and struggles. You were there for me. What sort of friend would I be? If I wasn't there for you now in, in all of your hard times, I, I can't just walk away from this person. So I did not cut the rope. I just kind of tied it to my waist. And, um, and I still believed that he was a friend. I still believed that he was a confidant. And so I did not see the hook when, let's see, Five years later, no, two or three years later, he introduced me to a friend of his, another pastor, strongly encouraged me to be in a relationship with this pastor. I remember asking him, are you sending me on, on some sort of assignment? Like, well, why are you so adamant that you want me to... And he was like, no, I just, I just really think you will like this pastor. I think you, and, and, and I did. And this one was single. Okay, we are making progress in the right direction. This pastor is single. Yay! But this pastor had no intention of marrying me. This pastor had no intention. <laughs> of publicly owning me, of having a relationship in public with me. I was 28, he was 56. And that went on for several years as well. Uh, friends with benefits arrangement, <laughs> we'll put it that way of me hoping that maybe he would change his mind, that you know, if I were good enough, if I were available enough, understanding enough, you know, maybe he would, he would change his mind and, and choose me. That, that's not how this works. And because that wasn't going to be a, a steady thing, you know, that wasn't gonna be a real relationship um this pastor the first pastor pastor one pastor two make it easy brought a second person into the equation well you know if you're not going to be with anybody how about this guy you know he he works in the church he's, he's all these things um and again i didn't see the hook i thought that these men were my friends. I thought they could be trusted. And so I didn't realize that I was being passed from one to another, to another, to another, to your friend, to your associate. <laughs> didn't see the hook. Pastor number two once told me, old men play the long game. But how can you know what the long game is when you're dealing with someone literally twice your age? You have no idea. You have no clue what the long game is. It was October of... 2018, I was scrolling Facebook and I came across a Me Too story. A woman my age was writing about a man who had led tours for um, graduating seniors. He would take them on trips around the world. He positioned himself kind of as this shaman, spiritual leader who was in touch with all these different native ceremonies and the like. And as she was describing how this person led her 
into a sexual relationship. I began to feel unsettled as I read her story because it sounded uncomfortably familiar. The things that she said this man said to her and did to, to lead her along this path um, to getting what he wanted from her. It sounded so, and I was rocking my brain. Why does this sound familiar? Where have I heard these lines before? Where? Wait. No, 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 no. No, that, that can't be. <laughs> that can't be. Because she is talking about a sexual predator. And I am thinking about a trusted friend. Somebody that nearly 10 years later I still talk to every week. There's no way. There is no way this person that I still love, that still has access to my life, Not sure what happened there, but <laughs> yeah, we're going to tell the story. So after realizing that there was a possible connection between the Me Too story of this woman and my own life, I went straight to Google <laughs> and I started Googling the attributes of a groomer. What does somebody say? What do they do when they are trying to bend your mind to their will? When they are trying to get you to do and be something that you would not ordinarily do on your own? How do they win the trust and the loyalty of the deceived so that you cover for them? And defend them even against your own best interests and it was a little difficult at first because most articles are written about the grooming of children there aren't as many about the grooming of adults of women but I found some and my heart dropped because with every article I found every checklist, every attribute, he was a perfect match. And I realized that everything I had believed up to that point about him, about all the men that he had put into my life, was not true. None of it was true. I realized that at that point in my life, I had had four sexual partners. Only one of them had I chosen myself. All the others were this pastor, his friends, and one of them had raped me. I was literally on the floor. It was too much to bear. I was literally on the floor in shock, in pain, as 10 years of my life just got ripped away. How could you? I was 23, dealing with the most traumatic moment in my life. And that is when you decided to take advantage of me, Pastor Herman Davis. And then you pass me to your friend, Pastor Marcellus Howard. And then you pass me to your, <laughs> to your tech guy, Clement, Hunter and you leave the door open for your friend to try his best to get at me <laughs> Pastor Bates <laughs> yeah. 
I knew at some point I would come forward with this story. I knew I would because I only realized the truth by the grace of women who had come before me and were courageous enough to tell their stories. I would not have realized when I did or if at all the truth had another woman not been willing to step forward and say this is who he is this is what he said this is what he did and I felt the need to give back to that same fountain from which I had drawn but I questioned whether or not it was necessary to say all the names. I questioned whether I should make it about anyone else other than Pastor Davis. Should I say all the names? And yesterday, when I saw that post, I realized why it was necessary to speak the names, all the names. Because Pastor Dade is Pastor Howard's best friend. And I have every reason to believe he knew what was going on. The three of us went out for dinner one day. We went to Panera and I was so honored that he would take notice of little me. He gave me permission to call him Pip. Oh, I couldn't believe that I would be allowed that familiarity. Pastor Dave would let me call him Pip. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, it's so painful. It's so painful thinking about how very naive I was for so long. For so very, very long. So many of you reached out to me and you were shocked, shocked and surprised. <laughs> or as Pastor Howard would say, shocked and amazed, shocked and amazed <laughs> that Pastor Dade would come for me like that. That is why, because it wasn't about the flyer, it wasn't about my protests. It was about the good old boys club. It was about attempting to speak to the Danielle they used to know, who would be cowed, who would have absolutely have shriveled and shrunk under the weight of such condemnation before. I would have been mortified, the old Danielle, to have had him speak to me like that in such a public forum. That was the Danielle they knew. <laughs> that is not the Danielle of now. The Danielle of now has gone through a whole lot of therapy. <laughs> the Danielle of now has got a community of support who I told the truth, the whole truth and who loved me and believed me and said they would stand by me when I was ready to own my truth. The Danielle of now understands that there are consequences to standing in this space and speaking these names and I accept them, whatever they will be, whatever backlash there will be, I accept it because I count whatever price I will have to pay for this moment cheap to have my freedom. And now I have it. So, if you are a woman listening to this and you at this point would rather not 
associate with She Speaks. The Women's Clergy Network of Andrews University is creating a database and you can and you should list there um, if you would rather not participate in She Speaks. If you would rather not be involved in Freedom Week and all the things that we have coming up, um, there are loads of women right now who are creating and who are sharing. You don't have to get it just from me. As you saw on that post, God has raised up an army of women. And if for whatever reason you feel that you cannot be in this space, I understand. I hold nothing against you. I just ask that you go and you find what you need from some other woman. It's okay, truly. If you are a woman who has your own story, who has your own hurt, who has names that you have not spoken, I will say this to you. If you choose to come forward, do not do it because you want revenge. Do not do it because you want him to pay. Do not step into that space with that spirit. Do it because you are grateful. You are so grateful for the community of women that have come before. And because you have a heart of love for the community of women who are coming after. I have no idea what this will cost me. And I accept that cost. I accept it. I am not captioning this outing him. I'm captioning it outing me because I will not make this about him, about them. I'm speaking my truth and I will pay whatever cost there is. Please understand though, if anything happens to me, I do have a community who is aware, who I have given all the receipts If anything happens to me, my community has all the receipts. I love you guys. I thank you for how you have embraced me. I thank you for how you have listened to me. And I ask that you will be equally as embracing and as loving to other women who will speak or be exposed for their brokenness, for their hurt. There is the assumption that, you know, once you're grown women, you make your own choices and own decisions. And well, she knew, maybe not, maybe not. Maybe she was acting out of a deep place of hurt. Maybe she was making decisions based on the lies that she had been told about herself and her worth. Maybe she made decisions out of ignorance because nobody told her the truth about her sexuality, about her body. This is why I am so passionate about this platform because I recognize that had I been told the truth, so much of my life might have been different. But I am here now, I will speak my truth now, and I will be here for any and every woman who is also struggling to find her place and her truth. So, whatever comes next, <laughs> in the words of a famous martyr, come forward. Apply the fire boldly to my face. Were I afraid, I would not be here. Much love.